So I wanna go back to these figurines. Now these figurines were, as Nellan Chang put it on uh, page 563, uh, they were first, some of these figurines were first found about 150 years ago. So uh, the late 19th century or the uh, late 1800s as they put it. And uh, that was the time when this idea of unilineal cultural evolutionism was really at its heyday. And so when they first found these figurines, they were actually mostly put into racial categories and they were trying to describe them in terms of race. Uh, and that is probably uh, exactly what people in this time were thinking about. Uh, later on, uh, especially after World War II and we found some more figurines, uh, the race stuff kind of faded out and people really got concentrated and hooked on the sexual and the, the gender, sexual and sexuality aspect of these figurines. So people don't really talk about them in, in racialized terms as much anymore as they do in terms of, the, of their sexual aspects. And like I said, this is really in part because of the way the world was framed, or I should say the way that the people believed that the world progressed from man the hunter to man the herder, uh, et cetera, uh, that that's the way these objects were interpreted. Now, there was a wonderful, wonderful article uh, that I used to assign. It was very fun to read. It was more, uh, it was actually more, more fun than the article that I gave you, in part because it was written in the popular science magazine Discover by Heather Pringle, who is not an archeologist, but a very good journalist. And uh, this article was written in, was published in 1998. So it's now about uh, almost, uh, almost 25 years old. The article was called New Women of the Ice Age. And what this article did was basically take some of the critique and the reassessment that we had have been talking about, reassessing the role of women and the ideas of hunting and gathering, and looked at these figurines in a different way. And what uh, Heather Pringle talked about is, you know, they didn't really know what exactly the figurines were for, but one of the things that they they kind of uh, speculated about is that uh, the females or women were using these in order to try to figure out the future, in order to read the future in a similar way that we would read lines on sort of palm lines and palm readings. And that, that so, uh, some of these figurines are actually found in fragments all over the place. And so the idea was that they were actually using fire uh, they were basically making what we'd, we might consider to be crude figurines and then exploding them and using that in order to foretell the future. And this sounded a little, a little bit out there, but they actually also had some analogies to contemporary hunter and gatherer societies. Uh, again, that idea of ethno-archaeology, where you don't want to necessarily say the people in the region are doing exactly what people did 10,000 years ago. But it was a kind of an idea that, that had, some, uh, ha had some credence because people described this in, uh, in recent times as well. And so this is one of the ideas about what these figurines might have been used for was uh, prophecy or divination. And now and Chang mentioned this uh, when they later turned to their explanation of different uh, different ways in which these figurines have been explained. The other thing that came up in this article and uh, was is the reason I had you skip that box in Levin and Schultz uh, on pages 135 to 137 is that uh, these figurines might have given a perspective on the female body. And so when we look back at that at that Lavin and Schultz box, which again, now and Chang mentioned on page 570, when they're talking about the possible uses for these figurines, uh, they talk about this. And several of you picked this out. In fact, Aiden, what could explain the weird anatomical proportions that we see in these figurines? The one from the book. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a pretty fascinating idea, right? So the idea is, yeah, if you're looking frontally at these things, they look weird. But if it was a woman looking down at her own pregnant body, that's how it would basically look. You'd have these sort of uh, larger breasts. You wouldn't be able to see your own feet oftentimes. And so the idea was that they would use these things in order to gain knowledge uh, not to give men knowledge, but to gain knowledge of their own bodies and their own selves during these critical times of pregnancy and reproduction. And they had a basically a medical use to them. So there are several ideas about what the figurines were used for. And one of the wonderful parts about this article, which I always loved, is the archaeologist Jim out of Osseo, who said, Whatever it was that they were used for, it was sure that they weren't these poor females waiting at home for these guys to bring home the bacon. In other words, this was not some sort of primitive porn object. And out of Osseo simply termed it, what crap. And so like I said, this article was fun to read and it was written about 25 years ago or published about 25 years ago. But the thing is, is that even after that, even more recently, and now when Chang's article was published in 2014, what they are responding to is why is it that you can have this article from a long time ago that was really fun to read and really popular and put out there a number of ideas that critiqued this idea of a male dominated society. And yet every time we discover another figurine, people are talking about how it's a pinup. And so the theme of their article, or one of the themes of their article, is why is it that we're still dealing with this stuff, even though there have been decades, de decades, 10 or 20, 30 years of critiques? You know, I could have probably assigned this, uh, the New Women of the Ice Age article to some of your parents. So why do we still have to do this 20 or 30 years later? Why is it still going on? And so I, I really like this article because it examines a lot of the myth-making or the assumptions that were made. But I do think the article falls into a little bit of the trap. I think one of the reasons why the critique doesn't stick is that if you just read the bold, if you just read the headlines, that's the stuff they're arguing against. Right, so if you just kind of skim through it, you'd think that they were saying all of these things. When in fact, they're trying to argue against these things, but they've used them as headlines. So I'm going to go through each of these headlines and what it is that is kind of the critique of that headline. And then I'm gonna try my own version of a title that is more positive than what I want you to think about instead of the critique. This is a classic problem that many anthropologists and social scientists have. We're very concerned with talking about what we don't believe and we never tell you what it is that we believe. So the first, one of the first things that a couple of you noticed was this idea that Venus figurines were made by men and for men. And now and Chang are very explicit, at least if you get past that headline, that in fact, we don't know who made these, but if you look back at the past, we see women making art, women making stone tools, women doing all of these things, children too. And so there's no reason that we should assume that these are objects that were made by men. And we certainly shouldn't assume that they were made for men either. So my big headline here, instead of this one, I would say, hey, women are involved, their contributions are hugely important, even in things like that we assume to be part of the male world, which is stone tools and making uh, art in the form of cult sculpture. Second headline, only men are aroused by visual stimuli. John, what do you say about that? Uh, basically, it's like people are saying that, like, um, between both genders, it's not only that men are aroused by visual stimuli, it's also found that women at the same time, too, are aroused by visual stimuli. They're trying to explain that 
only only men or women are not affected by that type of thing. But I've been held down that both genders equally. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, you find out when you go on the internet and see who's looking around where, turns out, I'll say it, turns out, I'm not going to say everybody likes it equally the same, but sometimes women like visual stimuli too. And so once you get beyond some of these surveys that were done, you know, 70 years ago when people didn't want to speak what was on their mind, uh, it turns out this is not necessarily a thing that is exclusively part of what guys are doing. All right, very good. Oh, yes, this was a, a, an interesting one. Uh, headline three, which is that all of the figurines are the same. Oh no, maybe I can call in a Zoomer. Brittany, are you there? going to work? No. All right. Anyway, the idea was that all of these figurines had the same waist to hip ratio and that this was kind of a sign of the evolution of, of what guys would like at the time. And what the headline should be, it's a complicated story, but basically it is that these figurines uh, show us all kinds of variability and diversity in body shape and what is called the waist to hip ratio or the WHR. So we are not dealing with, I forget those, the measurements, but the, you know, the 90, 60, 90 or whatever it is that is said to be ideal. In fact, we see all kinds of different uh, waist hip ratios in these figurines. Oh, one of my favorites. What would you say this is? Yeah. It's a rod with breasts. A rod with breasts, right. You see that pretty clearly. What's that? <laughs> is it still a rod with breasts? Or maybe it's something else. You can think of a different anatomical feature that it might be, right? There's no necessary reason. When you dig something out of the ground, you don't know which way it's supposed to be held or which way it's supposed to be exhibited. So as Nao and Chang say, this could equally be argued to be a representation of male anatomy as it is a rod with breasts, even though in the official museum exhibit, it gets put in as, a rod with breasts probably sounds better than I used to teach this class at 8 a.m. I always remember putting this picture up and a student freshman was like a dildo. So anyway, we don't know that it's that either, but who knows what it is? No need reason to think it's one or the other. Could be something entirely different too. The fifth headline is something that we should know from, is more appropriate for the more recent uh, gender archeology. span We'll be going into this more, uh, not in this unit as much as uh, when we get more into cultural anthropology and ideas about gender. The headline is that the Paleolithic or uh, people in this stone age time period uh, only recognize two genders and uh, I think that it's now, I mean, we don't know what their gender representation was, but certainly from many uh, indigenous and Native American societies, there were ideas of third genders, fourth genders, people that were called two-spirit people, I believe are mentioned in the Levin and Schultz. Again, we'll talk about this more as we go along, but there's no reason to assume that ancient peoples had only a male-female binary that there may have been different meanings across or different kinds of gender. And we see that certainly in, in, uh, in indigenous societies uh, in, in pre-European forms. Um, so there's no reason to assume that, that our contemporary binary, for finally getting beyond, is, uh, should be projected onto the past. 
the sixth headline is that if you're not wearing clothes, that means it's sexy or erotic. What would you say, Dylan? So I, I think I think you said that it's depicting uh, what biological yeah. sex or gender. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily have to be, I mean, it's kind of like in school when your teacher puts up the pictures for the first time in sex ed, you don't, you tell people don't get crazy about that. And basically, what I think they're trying to say here is that our ideas of what is erotic, let's say, uh, bare breasts, for an example, that we, you know, is one of the things we don't want to be doing in this country, but in other societies, that's not a, you know, it's not something that people are even thinking about. It's not something that you would even necessarily notice. And so what they're saying is just because you're seeing you, I don't mean you, just because we project our own ideas about, you know, whether we want to say we're more repressed or liberated or what, but we shouldn't project our own ideas onto the past because we don't know uh, we can even see today that you know different people, different societies classify different uh, different states as being as being uh, erotic or not. And so there's a lot of historical as well as cultural variation there. So we have to be careful about assuming these kinds of things. So I think it would help, I think it would help their article a little bit if instead of their headlines, uh, they sort of gave us the the critique as the headline and then talked about the stereotype or the assumption. Now, the question I think again is, is something that Nao and Chang are asking about, you know, why is it that after all these years, we still think in terms of, of man the hunter? Why has that become a huge category of our life? And I think there, there are a number of reasons for that. And, and one of them we saw back in when we were talking about uh, science studies, that science isn't, isn't separate from society. Just because you're a scientist doesn't mean uh, that you've abandoned all of, uh, that you're in some sort of weird uh, laboratory state. Science responds to the social concerns and the scientists are human beings too. And if your society is sexist, then your science is probably going to be along those lines as well. That's sort of the obvious. I also wanna talk about some things that are perhaps not so obvious or reasons why people are still into a man the hunter idea. Um, I think one of them is not necessarily a, a you know, about, about gender as much as it is that we want to believe that our ancestors were, you know, cool, that they weren't just scavenging and, you know, or they won't, weren't being hunted. I mean, nobody likes to think of, of your ancestors as being hunted on the African savanna. That sounds, sounds yucky. Um, so, you know, one of it is just trying to sort of glorify the, the ascent of human beings. It's also true that when we go to people who are hunters and gatherers, people tend to talk more about their hunting than they do about their gathering. I mean, it is more exciting to hunt. Well, I don't know if I wanna say that. It is, you know, berries, they just don't lend themselves to stories, tubers roots, they're just not, they can, but usually people tend to talk more about, you know, the, the one day. Now, it may be that the bulk of their calories come from the roots, tubers, and berries, but the once a month that you actually get something out there, it's more exciting. The other thing related to archaeology here, and we talked about this with archaeological methods, 
is that the things that we find in the archaeological record are often, uh, you know, the big bones. So if there was a mammoth, we'll see those bones. But if there were rabbits, those bones disappear. Similarly, with the instruments of hunting, if you have a spear with a stone biface, it's going to preserve. If you have a net, it is probably rotted away. Or sometimes some of those wonderful cave paintings, they're visible uh, in ways that, they, that you can see the evidence for a relationship with, uh, with non-human animals. And so part of it is simply the duration of the archeological evidence. And some of the reinterpretations of some of these groups have come from being able to sift through the archeological material in more sophisticated ways than we were in the past. The other thing that Nao and Chang say, and I've come to, to believe this, that's why I retitled all the headlines, is that people like simple explanations. You know, they like easy explanations. They like to know if it's this or that. They want to know why things happen. They don't like you to say, well, it could be female body perspective, but it also could be divination and foretelling the future. That's too complicated. And people don't like things if you're making them too complicated. And so part of the issue is that there are multiple uh, possibilities for how these figurines have been used. But it's easier to think of that it was just one. And so it's sometimes difficult. And like I said, I think in, to a certain extent, Nal and Chang get tangled in this trap because it's difficult to to try and figure out and to convey to people the complexity of a situation, which is easier if you just reduce it to one thing. So in this class, we've looked at, uh, we've looked back at the scope of archeology. span We've been looking at that period of the spread of Homo sapiens into all parts of the habitable world using hunting and gathering. A time before there was any agriculture, before there was any domesticated plants or domesticated animals. 